A warm welcome to another virtual session of the U3A here in Hermanus. Dr. John Bristow is one of the eminent geologists of South Africa. He has a PhD in geochemistry from the University of Cape Town with postdoctoral studies at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque in the United States. His practical geological experience encompasses many commodities, including precious metals like gold, base metals like iron, ore, and manganese, but in particular, diamonds. He has been involved in the diamond industry in various capacities in South Africa and in many countries in Africa, as well as other parts of the world. His lecture today will take us on a visit to India, both from a geological point of view, as well as a tourist point of view, and some of the interesting encounters that he had. John, thank you very much for your preparation, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Gerd. Thanks, Letitia, and uh, welcome to everyone this morning. And thanks, Gerd, for the introduction, and thanks to you and your U3A team for the great presentations that you've put on on this very regular basis. So, so I'm going to talk today about India. Um, it's, it's about basically a travel log um, with some geology um, thrown in along the way. It's the most fascinating country. I, I was fortunate enough to work there extensively in the late, late 19... 90s through to about 2005 and then I think been back there a couple more times and you'll see in 2005 Marilyn and I my wife attended a wedding so we'll end end with that sort of colorful event. This opening slide is a little poignant as well because this was still in the days that SAA flew directly to India before Dudu Mnyeni and the chairperson of SAA and Jacob Zuma got hold of the airline and more or less gave it away and the rest is history. So, so this was Marilyn and, and my flight to India 2005 to attend the wedding in good old SAA. So the presentation content are, are shown on the left there, and I'll refresh that as we go along. We're going to look at a bit of stats. Um, if you look on the top right there, you'll see India is a population of 1.4 billion and stabilizing, interestingly, it's about 18% of total world population. 35% of those are urban dwellers. And the important point there is, is the average or the median age is 28.4 years. So, so it has a really young, well-educated, um, very ambitious population. The land size is, is nearly 3 million square kilometers. And interestingly, as we all know, a very populated country, the density of India, 464 people per kilometer squared. Whereas here in South Africa, we have only 49 people per kilometer squared. And, and I think all of us are very aware and appreciate the wide open spaces that we still have in this country, particularly out west. The, the picture on that slide is really, um, from my perspective, what India is all about, which is diamond. So it, it's the world's biggest, not producer, but, but buys most of the world's rough diamonds, cut and polishes them, and then re-exports them. And that'll come up in the presentation. Just to give you an idea of where we're going, we're going to start in Mumbai. You can see there the gateway to India. We're, we'll come back to Mumbai. Um, and the, the water taxis, very, very colorful country, very colorful people. And then we'll head up to New Delhi. We'll go to Agra um, and, and Jaipur. Agra, of course, is the Taj Mahal. And then we'll move down to the southeast part of India in Andhra Pradesh and look at the, the diamond deposits of the Krishna River, the famous Krishna River, um, next door to Hyderabad. Hyderabad is where Golconda Fort is and where a lot of those early diamonds were traded. We'll then flip up to Panar and Bunda, which are, are, are what we would call lamproites rather than kimberlites that do produce some diamonds and then show you Riper, which was a, a, where we conducted an exploration project um, with a group out of South Africa and, and an Australian and Indian partner. And then we'll come across back to, to Mumbai and finish off the presentation. So just a summary of the history, very difficult to do. The history of India really starts in the Indo-Ganges plain up in the northern part, and we'll go there in the next slide. And that's where they see the earliest um, evidence of, of human beings. And then it has a fascinating history of being settled, of having wars and, and great amounts of destruction. And, and then we go back to uh, really the period of, of, of proper development of its civilization. The Indo-Aryan culture began to develop in what they call the early classical period. 
um, on the left hand side there, then we go into the, the early medieval, medieval period um, and, and notably their interesting name, the Gupta M Empire. Um, Gupta period was noted for a great deal of cultural creativity, literature, architecture, sculpture, paintings and so on. Um, and then the other um, fascinating period too was the, Mo the, the Mughal period um, in 1526 to sort of 1858 before the days of the Raj. Um, we'll touch on, on the Raj and then finish off with um, a bit on the on the partitioning of, of India, which um, is a fascinating period from a, a sort of colonial point of view. So that's that's a, a very quick summary, as I say, very difficult to, to properly portray this history, but certainly um, when it comes to culture, history, architecture, um, uh, music, and many other things, you know, India, India and the surrounding countries really paved the way. Um, religions, language, and costs I find I find fascinating. Um, the the um, the religions are indicated here um, at the bottom. Hindi obviously is is the dominant um, religion. Nearly eighty percent of the country Muslim, fourteen point two. Christianity is very strong, particularly down in the south, where there were a lot, there were a lot of um, Catholic settlers early in the, in the history of India. And then, and then this fascinating group of Buddhist Jains, the Jain and others. The Jains, um, particularly interesting, they they sort of drive most of the the business in India, and certainly the diamond business is driven by by the Jainists. Um, languages, 122 major languages. Sorry, thought we were uh, bad here in South Africa. Nearly 1,600 other languages. The most spoken: Hindi, English, and Bengali. And then we have this fascinating caste system, um, which developed really through divisions amongst the Hindus. Um, it, it, it's not that obvious anymore, certainly in the period that I've been going there, um, was, was more distinct and apparent in the late 1990s. But um, the more you go there, the less you see it these days. And, and that really came about through the way that the, the Hindu religion is interpreted and Brahma was the, the, the god whereby this whole caste system developed. Um, to move on, just, just looking at the, at the geology, um, a fascinating country for a number of reasons. First of all, if we look on the right-hand side diagram, India 200 million years ago was, was very much part of, of Gondwana land, um, this massive um, proto-continent or ancient continent. So if you look 200 years ago, Africa, Arabia, South America, East Antarctica, um, really the parts of the South Pole, Australia, of course, and India were all stuck together in, in a supercontinent. And so if you take the geology of India, if you go across to the left-hand side of the diagram, you'll see that this, this continent of, of India or, or Indian plate is, is very similar in geology to, say, the structure of South Africa. We here in South Africa sit on an ancient craton, what we call the Kampfal craton here in the interior. And then we have, have mobile belts surrounding it. So if you go and look at India, the same sort of structure exists. Um, the, these pink... Um, pink, orange um, cratons, as you'll see, um, several of them. Um, and they are surrounded by these sort of blue lined areas. Um, you'll see how, for example, the rift, or, and, and these, these are the much younger um, portions of India that sort of stuck together the old cratons. The cratons actually look like an iceberg. They have a veneer showing up on the top of old ancient rocks, typically older than 2 billion years, 2,000 million years. And they suck together by rocks which are sort of younger than, than 1800 or 2000 million years. And, and we refer to those as the mobile belts. India, India too, interestingly, has the Deccan traps, this green area of the very thick um, basalts, um, not unlike the Karoo basalts or the basalts that we find in Lesotho, those flat lying gray rocks, old lava flows. But whereas our basalts are 184 million years old, these are about 65. So this was a younger um, extrusion of, of hot molten material at about 65 million years. And then the fascinating thing about India, of course, is as if we look again on the right hand side of this next diagram, um, we, we now see, sorry, we, we now see um, 
um, the the con or the the spread of the continents, the structure of the Earth as we know it today, with um, these plates now all drifted off. Gondwana broke up for sort of 160 to 120 million years ago, and India went skidding off into into Asia, um, and it's been bulldozing into Asia at a rate of about nine to 16 centimeters per year, which is really um, you know, it's almost a, a, a racing car type speed. And, and if you look at the diagram in the middle, you'll see there um, the consequence of, of India, the Indian plate on the left, um, pushing into or bashing into, the, the, into Asia, into the Tibetan plateau. And, and with the creation of the Himalayan mountain chain, um, sort of through the middle of that diagram, and, and you can also see the a suture where those two, two plates, two geological plates are impacting one another. Um, and if you look at the, the left-hand diagram, you'll see where India was 55 million years ago, 38 and 10, and currently today. And, and that process, you get the mountain chain, the Himalayas, but behind that, we, we tend to get a basin. Here, the Ganges Plain would typically be what we call a back up basin. The, the, this material that's colliding and sinking, um, where my arrows now should be able to see and going under the Tibetan Plateau, actually tends to drag down um, a portion of the material behind the mountain chain. And that's where this big Ganges and, and big rivers sit, which have been really important in the development of, of the whole of India and surrounding areas. So 80 million years ago, India was 6,400 kilometers further south compared to where it is today. And, and the fascinating thing, and this is a bit tongue in cheek, um, is that Everest continues to rise to about two inches per year. So, so technically, no, no climber has yet to reach the top of the world's highest mountain because by the time you get there, turn around and go back, um, you know, when you leave, it's actually going to be a bit, bit higher um, by the time the next guy comes along. So just a little minor, as I say, tongue in cheek point. If we look at these two fascinating diagrams, these are now um, sort of aerial views of, of India on the left, um, sort of a, a geological landscape. You can see Tibet and the Asian plate to the north, the Himalayan mountains, and, and take note of how narrow that belt of mountains are. Um, you know, not, not unlike the, the sort of sinuous and fairly narrow mountain belts we get along our coastline and the Cape, um, both along the southeast coast and up the north, northwest coast. Behind it is this fascinating behind the Himalayan, play, um, Himalayan chain, that is, is the Indus Ganges Plain. And importantly, you can see, see the big rivers um, running, um, some of them running off, off, obviously down into the Bay of Bengal to the southeast, the others running into the Arabian Sea to the, to the west. And, and again, for those of you that attended, Evan Shaw presentation, you will remember that he talked about the five rivers of, of Pakistan and the importance of that irrigation scheme in that part of the world. And fascinatingly, if you look across at the right hand diagram, it's a, a night shot um, from, a, from a satellite, you'll see the huge density of people and lights along that Indus, Indus Ganges plain for obvious reasons. That's where there was water, there was very fertile ground and you could plant crops and, and develop um, your livelihood. And that's really where this ancient civilization sort of started in India, going back to, sort of to five million years and then really developing um, in, in abundance sort of 2000, from 2000 years ago. Um, so just, just interestingly to see, in, interesting to see there how the, 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 the geology and the geography is in a sense also constrained or, or had some control on where the, the densest parts of, of India are in terms of people living there. Okay, let's, let's move on to, to Northeast Delhi. And I really just highlighted um, a couple of particular points. The, these, these cities and areas have so much history and so much culture, it's very difficult to, to capture all of that. So, so fascinatingly, the national capital territory of Delhi is officially a city and a union territory and, and New Delhi fits in there as, as the capital of India, of India as, as the union territory. 
and modern Delhi is a cluster of several cities spread across this metropolitan region. The thing that's most fascinating there is, is, is that Delhi has been captured, ransacked and rebuilt several times, particularly during the medieval, medieval period. Um, and and that's, that's the thing that strikes you most in, in India is, is, is the culture and the, the destruction uh, and passing of one culture and the rebuilding of another culture. Having said that, though, the, the, the fact that they um, repair and maintain their ancient history and ancient buildings is also fascinating. Um, and, and again, I'll, as I flip through this, we'll see some of these, these old structures. So on the left-hand side bottom are, are the gates that effectively lead up the sort of plaza or, or long walkway to, to the Houses of Parliament where Maryland's standing at these amazing steel gates and in the background you can just see the part of the Houses of Parliament and if you look down the other way um, you see this um, fascinating arch on the right which is sort of the gateway to Delhi so to speak. Um, there, there, is, there, there is an incredible amount of, of, of history and um, particularly fascinating architecture around Delhi and I've just sort of picked one of the things that fascinated me um, or us this this tall structure is 72 meters high, 72 and a half meters. It's longer than three cricket fields. It's going on to sort of four cricket fields. Um, cricket field, uh, not cricket field, cricket pitch, typically 20 meters in length. And, and it was built back in the days without um, theodolites, GPS, and all the fancy um, engineering gear that we have today. And if you actually go and look at the artwork, the fluting on those columns, some of them are rounded, the others are, are angular, and, and the precision um, engineering that went into that structure, it, it really is truly remarkable. And you'll see there, as in, in, in most of the monuments and old buildings of India, there's scaffolding on, on the left-hand side, and, and all of those old buildings are continually maintained and repaired. Okay, and then for those of you who haven't been to India, you definitely need to put it on your bucket list. And obviously, this is the Taj Mahal, and just the most amazing and exquisite building you could um, you could wish to see. And and it's it's very it's very surreal. It's very difficult to really explain what it is. Um, when you get there, you see this um, white building in the background, but when you, which, so, so we are walking through the, the, the south entrance looking at the Taj Mahal now, and, and you see this almost sort of um, surreal uh, building coming out of, out of the sort of haze. And it, it, it really is just a tr truly remarkable building. And, and it's made of, of white marble, um, which is largely, um, sort of layered and and uh, plated onto onto the red sandstones of the, of this area, old um, Proterozoic sandstones, and and all of this was built by by hand back in the Mughal pe Mughal period. That, that you can see 1632 um, AD um, by um, the Mughal Johan to house the tome of his favorite wife. Um, it was then complete. It was only completed in about 1648, and also then houses his um, his tomb as well. And, and a fascinating the, the symmetry, the, the, the real sort of um, aspect of that period of of architecture was the symmetry of the structures. And, and those those four towers, for example, all have a slightly lean a slight lean away from the actual main building in case there were to be earthquakes or movements. So if there was, they would fall outwards and not damage the, the main structure. But, but the precision and the, the attention to detail and the filigree and the inlays of stone, if we go on to this next one, you'll see Marilyn here standing looking at a, at a mural and inlays of semi-precious stones. And then this uh, picture on the left hand side just shows one of the side views of this um, amazing building. And as I say, very hard to, to really describe it to you. You really need to go and see it. The, 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 thing, is, the thing we also found fascinating there is that, um, and, and it happens in several places in India, if you look at that um, text top left there, 
there's a 10,400 square kilometer exclusion zone around the Taj Mahal to protect the monument and, and other buildings from pollution. And there was a 1996 Supreme Court ruling whereby the use of coke, um, coke and coal was banned in that area to again prevent or minimize pollution. And, and when I just think of Hamanus and the, the problems that um, Fernkloof has had, for example, recently to get a lease extended, you know, we have this incredibly important area. It's hugely important for the Hamanus aquifers, but it almost is impossible to get an area like that properly protected. And, and we could certainly take um, some, some advice and take note of what happens in India when it comes to preservation and protecting their their, their special areas and special buildings. The traditional craftsmanship there lives on. Um, this is a, a studio where they make um, tabletops and small tables and big tables and other uh, mementos of your trip to, you'll see for example, bowls all inlaid with semi-precious stones. And that work is still done by craftsmen who have sort of followed family lines for hundreds of years. And, and you'll see even there to the point on, on the bottom right of the screen, the traditional way of, of cutting and polishing the pieces of stone and cutting, cutting and polishing the marble is still done by young, young men, trainees effectively, learning the trade so that they eventually can progress to, to actually being able to do the, the very fine inlay work. And all of that is stuck together by ground up limestone, you know, basically a, a cement. Okay, let's move on to, to Jaipur, the pink city. So this is still up in the north of India, the block um, sort of or the, the circle that I showed you where you had New Delhi in, in the north, um, Taj Mahal, Agra to the southeast and Jaipur now is off to the, off to the sort of southwest. It's the capital of the state of Rajasthan. Getting out there, it gets um, it's starting to get drier. Um, it's a big city. It was one of India's first planned cities, and it was painted pink by the ruler Sawai Ram Singh first to welcome His Royal Highness Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, in 1876 in the days back then of the Raj. And King Edward, you historians probably know better than me, King Edward VII became obviously King of England and Emperor of India. Um, it, it's a, it was a fortified city on the on the right hand side, top right. You'll see um, part of the forts again, most of it quite well maintained, and and strung across hills that sort of surround um, the depression in which Jaipur sits. And and down on the right hand side, typical sort of shopping scene, and you'll see there you can even buy pinky saris. Um, so so you know you name it, you can get just about anything that's pink in in this part of the world in India. Fascinatingly, Jaipur is also the home of colored gemstones. So, so, so this is not diamonds, this is um, semi-precious stones, gemstones. And, and it, it's, it's the, the local center or an, and an international center for colored gemstone trading, cutting and polishing, and jewelry, jewelry manufacture. And the sort of stones we talk, we're talking about are amethyst, cornelian, typically um, you'll see some of this yellow, um, mineral across on the right hand side is cornelian, emerald, obviously the green, there's, a one, there's one and a piece of jewelry left hand side, tanzanite, most of us will have heard of tanzanite, garnets, lapis lazuli, sapphire, topaz and many more and in the, in the bottom of these um, pictures on the left is a classic salon blue sapphire, but most of the world's top sapphires actually come from what, what salon or what we know as Sri Lanka. Um, Rajasthan as a whole is also famous for its just general craftsmanship when it comes to jewellery. Silversmithing is, is very popular there and, and many of the people, particularly out in the more rural areas, still wear anklets and, and, and silver jewellery, um, headgear for example. Um, in, in the top slide again you'll just see some different um, pieces of semi-precious stones. Um, the, the light blue will be lower quality sapphires. Uh, top left there, there's the pieces of cut and polished um, quartz and, and a quite dark piece of citrine up, up top right. And, and the one thing that you, you, you find in all of this is work is, is the quality of the workmanship. Um, so if we just go, go to this slide, this is um, 
a picture. The, these, like the diamond businesses, um, they, they, they long-standing family businesses. Many of these businesses have been in place for, for several generations. Um, and they, they, they are um, adopting technology. You'll see on the right-hand side, um, and, and look at, again, the cleanliness. Um, and that's, that's really what Indians do amazingly well, is when it comes to manufacturing and producing polished stones, much like the diamond business, they do, they do a really exceptional job. And as I say, they've embraced um, technology to make sure they stay competitive internationally in terms of cost and quality. Um, it, it's a very colorful city, even if you go to sort of the showing rooms or, you know, you're going to buy jewelry or you're going to bulk buy cut and polished stones, you get shown into these very um, sort of ostentatious and colorful showrooms to, to look at the product and you get lots of good um, Indian sweets and tea and it's really an experience to, to be experienced. And, and, and again, looking at this slide, you just see the contrast of this amazing country. So here we are, and, and the two left-hand pictures are um, out in, in sort of outside Jaipur. Elephants are used, used as a form of transport. So these elephants were actually used to take rides. There has been, for interest, a big drive to, to um, uh, properly look after the elephants. In the past, if you read the history and see the pictures, there's been a lot, a lot of mistreatment of India, uh, of Indian elephants. I don't know if you, some of you have been following with the lockdown has had a huge impact on, on these sort of animals and places like Sri Lanka. And there was an article, I think yesterday, of, of elephants wandering across rubbish dumps to actually find food. So, you know, tourism in these countries is big and it has a huge impact on, on this sort of situation when, when tourists don't pitch up. Uh, bottom right, camels, as I said, it's a dry part of the world getting out into semi-desert, so camels work well. And, and the, 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 the ubiquitous tuk-tuk, uh, we even use this for some of our field work down in the southern part of India. So we got around the, the rice paddy fields much quicker than walking on a tuk-tuk. Okay, so we've covered the, the top left, um, New Delhi, Agra, Jaipur. We're going to sort of switch back to, to diamonds now and, and we'll go and sort of look as a start at the Krishna River, which is where the diamond business had its roots in India. Fascinating river, not, not unlike our Val Orange River system, a big river that runs into the Bay of Bengal in Southeast India and, and the headwaters of that river almost back on the west coast and and as i say you know if we look at our Val orange orange river system the Val river starts way across in the eastern highlands or the, or the eastern part of south africa and then goes down to to douglas and meets with the orange and the orange goes out on our west coast so some of the sort of thing our orange river also produces amazing diamonds and there were lots of amazing diamonds that came out of the Krishna. And then we'll jump up to, to Panar in this area, back to the northeast, just look at the little Kimberlite there. And then we'll come down to, to Riper, um, where we ran an exploration program, and then we'll go back to, to Mumbai. Okay, to, in, diamonds go back sort of 2,000 years. There's a, there's a whole legacy and history of diamonds going back for that long in India. And, and the business really started in, in ancient alluvial deposits. And if you go through the old literature, as you'll see in the right hand side here, you get these amazing pictures of, of the, so this is a, a picture of a, a diamond mine in a, an alluvial deposit. Um, you'll see that the various gods, Hindu gods protecting the miners. Maybe we need to trace, try and uh, use it in this country more. You'll see the mining and the extraction and the washing going on here in the sort of middle left part of the diagram. And some da somewhere down here in the deep dungeon, people obviously pulling out um, bags of gravel and, and sending them up for processing. Um, the, the Indians are, are real masters at cutting and polishing small diamonds. Um, it, it, every year or, or last year, as an example, there was 138 million carats of diamonds mined in the world. Most of that material is very tiny. We call it melee. It's smaller than 0.2 of a carat um, um, per, per grain. So a carat is, is 0.2 of a gram, but uh, we then go to melee like this handful of material that the, that the person on the left is holding, a lady holding, 
that is what we call melee so it's extremely small stuff and and most of that goes into um, the world sort of pave um, you'll know pave jewelry the face of a watch full of small diamonds um, and the bling you know the blingy sort of jewelry um, belts and um, necklaces and that that um, that are less expensive than real diamonds and that people buy to sort of show and, and flash um, so the Krishna River is really where the business started and, and if we look at this diagram you'll see here up the box in red Krishna River the main sort of areas of mining were close to Hyderabad Hyderabad is where the Golconda fort is and Golconda became the main trading area for for big diamonds and this river um, produced most of India's famous diamonds and, and there's a list of them here some of you might have heard of them there's lots written about them um, the Hope Diamond, for example, the big blue diamond that is housed in the Smithsonian in, in the United States. The Dresden Green, another very famous diamond. And the Koinor, which is in the, in, in, in the Crown Jewels. Obviously, the Crown Jewels have mostly um, cut and polished stones from the Cullinan Diamond, um, from our um, Cullinan Diamond Mine. But the, the Koinor is also in one of the, the Crown Jewels as well. So, so historically, this river produced these, these massive diamonds or big diamonds. And again, if you look here, just a bit of history, you can look at how far back this, this diamond business goes. And, and there, there are lots of um, um, you know, fun, fun books and references to, to diamonds you know, pitching up along the way. And most of those early diamonds for the first sort of 2,000 years of the industry would have come come from India. So that's that's the Krishna River. Shown here are some of the other localities. We're going to go up after Krishna just to look at Panar, a small diamond mine on the north, and then we'll come back to to Raipur. But really, if if we take the Krishna River, it also has very very close similarities, as I said earlier, to our Orange and Val River deposits. Okay, this, this is just uh, another snapshot. This is the Valley of Diamonds, which um, from the tales of Sinbad the Sailor um, uh, and, and the Arabian Nights. I'm sure some of you in your youth would have read that. Um, and that's the sort of history that, that belies the, um, the underlying um, diamond business. This Paritalia um, diamond mine, we, we went to the site that no longer exists. This was back in the 1885 period. Where, where the, the, the Brits had sort of got in, involved, um, the Raj, and they had um, organized, you'll see here, the railway line and um, cocoa pans for moving gravel to a processing plant. This would have probably been living accommodation, the, the, the thatched hut. And you'll notice they even had the, the, um, the pigeon loft um, set up for, for um, you know, maintaining the, the traditional British um, tradition back then. Okay, this is a this is just a, a, a snapshot of the the Golconda Fort at Hyderabad. Hyderabad is a lovely city. Uh, it's really worth a visit if ever you get there. It's 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 an IT city, um, not not as strongly so as um, Bangalore, Bangalore to the south, um, but it also has a pretty good cricket team. So I'm sure you've seen or maybe seen some scenes of it when the IPL was still being held in India. So, so many of the Golconda diamonds were, were traded here in the Mughal period. That This again was a big fort um, area built across sort of a mountain stronghold on the, on the I think it's the southwest side of, of um, Hyderabad. And um, one, on the left hand side, one of the diamonds, the Darinor, which is in the Iranian crown jewels, interestingly. Um, a large 100 carat plus diamond, crudely fashioned in a rectangular shape. And the three gentlemen on, on the right hand side were some of the people I worked with. Dr. Babu was a, an Indian geologist and expert in diamonds. And so we used him quite extensively in our, our ventures to look for diamonds in India, starting just before um, 2000 and continuing through to about 2005. Mike Scott, who, who, who created and ran Mike Scott and Associates, and he was um, running or representing MSA out there. And then Mark Small, a Australian geologist who represented Europa Diamonds, a small um, Australian junior company out of Perth. 
and and so um, Europa, Europa, Europa had a, a joint venture with an Indian DMT partner, and Mike and myself and Dr. Baba were providing technical input and, and advice. Mark Small sadly died of cancer, but a lovely guy. He was he was a New Zealander and a great geologist. Okay, so let, let's um, carry on. Look at looking now at sort of at diamond rocks. This is this is the Majigawan or Pana diamond mine in northeast India. It's a small lamprite. We we in South Africa talk about kimberlites. There they have lamprites. It's this very brown rock full of um, these black spots are olivines for interest. Um, this one age of emplacement is is just over a thousand million years, and it's been mined on a very irregular small scale basis um, for probably the past 100 years or so. Um, it, it has a very low grade, 10 carats per 100 tons, so it's not particularly rich, and that's probably been one of the reasons that it, it wasn't really um, mined out quickly. Associated with that Panar um, lamprite, obviously that, that rock or that intrusion a thousand million years ago would have been eroded down. It, um, I didn't show you, but there on the right hand side is a sort of classic example of what a, a, a lamprite or a kimberlite complex looks like. Um, these, these rocks, um, kimberlites or lamprites, have to start their life at about um, 150 km kilometers down below us to get into the diamond stability field. And they're effectively the passenger train that, that brings the, the diamonds to surface. And if they fully preserved, for example, some of you looked or, or watched Mike DeWitt's program of Botswana, um, if you take the Arapa diamond mine, 110 hectares in Botswana, you'll have a you'll have the top of the the complex still preserved. Um, if you go to Pana, a lot of it's been eroded off, and then when you go to some of our deposits around Kimberley and that, we get into the fissure systems, where you then down into the roots of these ancient volcanic features. Okay, so so as Panar was eroded, it released diamonds, and and those diamonds got washed into old rivers and formed gravel deposits adjacent and in the surrounding hills around the Panar diamond mine, and these are mined by artisanal activities and and mostly by ladies. You, you drive around India, and when it comes to hard work and the right rice paddy field fields and elsewhere, it's it's typically women doing the hard work. And here um, the women are, or they, they dig out this very hard um, silicified gravel. You can see the boulders um, in, caught up in this fine sand, similar stuff to which we get on some of our beaches. And they then take that, they, they, they go and wash it um, in a local stream. And you can see that there's a, a broader picture here on top right and a, an up close picture um, bottom right where a woman has got a, a sieve and she's sieving um, sort of um, broken up gravel in in that sieve in a pond of water and, and as she shakes that sieve the very fine material um, sand and clay material is washed out and she'll end up with a, a coarser concentrate and if she's lucky she'll find the odd diamond in, in that sieve or screen. Okay, that, let's just move on to, to the exploration area that we, we then worked in, and, and actively worked on. So in, in about 1997, um, the joint venture between Europa and the Indian Diamantia was awarded a, a large prospecting block known as D7 on the eastern side of um, what was then Madhya Pradesh. That state was then subdivided. Um, a bit later on in about 2002 or 2003, I think it was. Anyway, we started an exploration program in, in that block um, after winning that tender um, that the Indian company and, our joint, and the joint venture partner applied for block D7. We were awarded it. It did have four known Kimberlites. You can see here Beridi, Kodamali, Jangra and Palikant and um, Beridi, should actually be a small diamond mine, um, but it, it never quite got there because of the politics. And this big blue block, um, or blue and um, sort of yellowish block, is where we ran an exploration program for a couple of years. We had a base camp um, in, in mine, mine Per. You can see there, Mine Per was, is a little farming village. We lived in, and when I say we, I, I regularly stayed there. But our team lived in that village and were extremely well looked after. 
and we went about prospecting, collecting samples. A lot of the area is very pretty. It's in sort of quasi jungle-like countryside. So we, we, we collected stream samples. We would then process those samples looking for what we call kimberlite indicator minerals or diamonds. And that way we would sort of backtrack to hopefully find kimberlites that had been missed. And we found a couple of those. We also had a, 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 a test plant built, a pleats jig. Um, this is the structure on the bottom right. It's really just um, a, a, a trommel, a washing plant. You can see the barrel there, and it goes down onto fairly fancy um, vibrating jigs and screens, which separate the heavy material and the light material. If their diamonds are there, that we'd find them in the heavy material. And that, that jig, interestingly, that whole structure was copied in RSA in South Africa and made in India very efficiently and for very low cost. So that, that was where we were out on the project. Um, the project did a lot of good work, I must confess. We built housing for, for the local people. We set up a laboratory. These are people working for us. Um, we train local women and, and young girls to, to work in our laboratory. And on the left-hand side is the little village that, that we actually you know, lived in and, and used as our base. So this house with the thatch roof um, back left there was, was our, our house. And, and the food and the service we got was just amazing. Um, these are the, the classic water oxen of, of India, which you see everywhere. And, and on the left-hand side, off to the left here, was a well point where we got fresh water. But it, but it was a wonderful experience. And working and living with people and eating the food with them out in the countryside was just, just fascinating. Okay, so that's, as I say, a snapshot. This was always going to be, a, as I said, a travel log rather than getting too detailed. Um, that project, unfortunately, ground to a halt. Uh, when, when, the, when the big state of Madhya Pradesh was split off um, to, into two states, Chattagar and, um, and Madhya Pradesh, um, there was a new um, senior minister um, uh, appointed to head up the, the state of Chattisgarh. The whole process got very complicated and messy. There was a lot of corruption, not unlike the sort of stuff we've seen here in our provinces. And eventually um, the, the DMNT group and our joint venture partners partner decided to to stop the program and park everything so a lot of that infrastructure is still there that we still get um, calls and contacts from the people wanting to know when we're coming back there was talk um, prior COVID that things might be improving again I think COVID's killed that for a while but you know maybe in the, in the years to come that project will be resurrected and it's not the first project to to die like that, India, uh, um, Rio Tinto, the world's sort of second biggest um, mining company, also found a, a very important um, kimberlite or a lamproite known as Bunda um, up in the north of India. And eventually they gave it back mm -hmm. to the Indians because they just couldn't get through the politics and the bureaucracy to develop it. Okay, let's switch back to, to India where our time is marching up, marching on on us. Back to Mumbai. So this is the Taj Mahal Hotel, um, a, a very fancy hotel. Some of you will remember that there was a sad incident there several years ago where, where there was a terrorist raid and people were killed. But we, we regularly stayed that in, in the Taj Mahal if we were going through Mumbai, meeting with our partners, and it was certainly a great place to stop over and if you were coming into the country or leaving the country you had a great pool and you lived a very colonial life okay so so mumbai dominates the the, the the diamond mining business if i go back to the slide it's capital of the international diamond industry 90 percent of the world's rough diamonds so that's diamonds that come out of the ground out of the mines and they have to go somewhere to be you know cut and polished well 90 percent of them are bought by indian family businesses um, and, and they then get cut and polished and resold. And, and that's fantastic because the Indians do an amazing job, but it's been pretty catastrophic for the diamond industry because with COVID, when India locked down on the 20th, 25th of March, 2020, the diamond business basically ground to a halt. And, 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 and that's what's been in place for, the red, for, for most of this year, very little diamond trade. And it's had a huge impact on countries like Russia, and um, Botswana. Um, so Russia is the largest producer of diamonds, Botswana is the second largest, 
and their business and economy have ground to a halt as a consequence. Fortunately, they're a well-managed country. They don't have too many people, 2.2 million, and their economy is extremely well looked after. So they have sovereign funds and money in the bank, and I guess that will sort of nurse them through the, the current crisis in the industry. So, so when it comes to the polished product, um, so the Indians and these Indian factories, you'll see there a classic example, bottom left-hand side of, of cutting and polishing stones. Um, you'll see a polishing lap again on the right-hand side. And interestingly, again, I noticed in my period there, so previously, you know, men folk doing all the cutting and polishing, while well, you're seeing an increasing number of women in the business as well. So when it comes to the polished stone, 60% share of the market by value is is basically controlled by the indians 80 percent by volume and 92 percent by quantity of, of the actual actual stone so this is now in the polish this is where you've taken the rough and you've cut and polished it um, on these laps and you finish it and it goes into jewelry um, and effectively in india so india makes as we say cut and polishes eight out of every polished stones to exceptional quality and you just can't beat it in this world and that's um, cuts um, clarity um, color and and what, what's the fourth fourth one i'm, I'm missing but anyway it, it's it's the four four c's um and and it, and it really is exceptional um right so so and, and, and like everything, even though it's, it's family businesses, and like we've seen in the polished stone, um, semi-precious stones that we saw in Jaipur, technology is increasingly coming to the fore. And, and here we see um, laser cutting of diamonds. Obviously, it's very difficult to do it on the, on the very tiny stones. It's really, um, there is some laser cutting, but it's also a lot of human labor. But we now have technology, as we see on the right hand side, where you can take a diamond, typically a biggish diamond in this case, and you can put it in, a, in an image analysis system and you can work out how many diamonds of what quality and shape you can then get out of that single diamond. So you can maximize your, your recovery and, and hence your productivity. And, and so this is how the Indian, and, and, the, and this will be, this is one of the DMNT groups that I visited. This is a typical family business. They'll employ, you know, in, in the smaller ones, hundreds of people, in the big ones, thousands of people um, cutting and polishing diamonds to, to top quality. One, one of the real giveaways and, and, and important aspects of, of business in India, and particularly the diamond business, if you look at the bottom right hand side of that slide you'll see there in india you can cut you can cut polish and extend the diamond to exceptional top quality for ten dollars a carat because of this work ethic attention to detail obviously technology and 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 just um precision work if you go to to belgium belgium antwerp is an important diamond hub it'll cost you 70 dollars a carat if you come to south africa and i've checked all these numbers it's 120 dollars a carat and convert that back to rand it's a lot of rands and 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 and, and we have this big debate in our minerals and mining business where well, we produce all these diamonds in this country why don't we cut and polish and beneficiate well the simple reason is that you cannot compete um, in terms of labor costs. You know, Indian Indians very seldom go out and strike um, compared to South Africa. Um, so, so when it comes to to things like this, you know, this ten dollars versus one hundred and twenty dollars, it's a no-brainer where you're going to get your diamonds cut and polished. And, and there's a lot more to Mumbai. Um, you, you've got to get your laundry done. So this is a, a lovely shot. Um, this is service with a smile, 24 seven, rain or sunshine, you can get your washing and laundry done with, with great pride along the way. So, so, you know, when you go to India and particularly a place like Mumbai and some of these big cities, make sure you get off the beaten track to where, you know, where the cities really work and, and live and eat and, and don't sleep, including the slums. And then we, we hear a great deal about Uber Eats. Well, you know, again, fresh food delivery happened in India many, many years ago. And there's, there's this lovely system, which those of you who've been there will have heard about the Dabawalas. 
So you go off to work in the morning with your briefcase and head for the office. They, they have a very good bus system and they have a, a very good taxi system for those who are a little more affluent. You'll see one in the background there, the yellow cab. But you then um, leave a message with the, the local double wallers or the local sort of chapter. And sort of mid-morning, the local guy on his bicycle, as per the left-hand side, they will come along and pick up your hot meal. And, and, and he then takes it to a central point and it gets onto this trolley on wheels. And these gentlemen in that right-hand diagram with smiling faces are then delivering um, that your hot food somewhere in there in one of those canisters to your office and you at lunchtime will get your readily um, efficiently delivered um, hot meal at 12 o'clock or 12.30 whenever you need your lunch and, and that is done without maps, GPS, smartphones, laptops and computers. So this is, you know, detail, attention to detail and a service with a smile that's been going on for, for many, many years and it works like a charm. Okay, and then just to start wrapping up, we, we had a great experience in 2005, we, January, we were invited to a wedding of a, a well-to-do, one of the top um, Indian diamantes, um, diamantes as we refer to them, are the, the big um, Indian cutting and polishing businesses, family owned, in this case the Parikh family. Um, and their, their son was getting married to the daughter of the Mittal family. Now the Mittal family, like all these families, is big. There's a super rich um, Mittal that we'll come to in a couple of slides who controls most of the world's iron, iron um, smelting, iron manufacturing, iron ore manufacturing, steelworks. Um, we've had them here in Mittal. Um, they've just closed the Saldana steel factory. Um, so, so we were invited to this wedding um, by, by the family and, and it really was a wonderful affair. So we, we flew across and that was the picture I started with. Um, we didn't attend the full week of ceremonies, but we were there for about five days. Um, when we arrived, we stayed in the Taj Mahal. Um, we, we paid our own way. It wasn't an entire freebie, but the clothes were, were made to fit and, and all paid for. So we got a series of suits I did and Marilyn got a series of really fancy saris and, and you'll see us dressed there to the nines um, and, and we had attended a whole series of family events and then the, the formal wedding um, ceremony at, at the end of the week. So, so this was for example one of the, the, the events there was a family musical function where various members of the family again you know these these people are serious when it comes to arts and culture and the job they do and 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 everything else um, and so we the bride and groom on the left hand side there and Marilyn having her hands and feet and ankle painted in the in the henna um, tradition um, so so you'll see that if you read the the, the, the text box typically day before the wedding this happens and you get mm -hmm. these colorful um, pictures um, done on your hands and various parts of your limbs and, and again an, an incredibly colorful event the whole the whole wedding and all the ceremonies were were wonderfully colorful so that that was the henna party and then this incredibly lavish final function was the the final wedding ceremony at the Royal Western India Turf Club in Mumbai and that alone you know going to a venue like that was quite something so arriving on on the bottom left lots of flowers, the red carpet, including for lesser mortals like ourselves. The tables here, um, the layout before the main meal and, and note the, the um, proteas, um, King proteas, dozens and dozens of them. And there were music shows and, and uh, orchestras and, and you name it, it was there. And this venue is a history vanning, uh, spanning two centuries. It was built in the days of the Raj and it's a mirror image of the of the Melbourne course. So, so um, but very interesting how the, the sort of Raj history has stayed and still very obvious in India. And it was something Evan Shaw noted in his talk on Pakistan that the, you know, the British traditions and anything British is still, in a sense, you know, very, very savoured and, and popular in India. Um, in, in Pakistan, you know, you see it everywhere. And again, in India, if there's a, a British building and particularly old buildings, 
they're all still there. Some of the train stations, old, um, you know, British built, British architecture are there and still being used to this day. So, so very interesting in spite of the, in spite of the, the sort of bad sides of the, the Raj and some of the things that happened in the colonial days, that kind of sort of gets forgotten. But um, the, the good points and the architecture and, and a lot of the culture lives on regardless. Um, weddings with the difference. I just, difference. I just thought I'd throw this in. This was um, the wedding of Lakshmi Mittels. Lakshmi Mittels. Um, daughter I think it was um, he's he's the second richest man in India um, and and he set up a wedding for his daughter and son-in-law cost 60 million dollars can you believe it um, and he flew or they flew something like a thousand guests from all over the world by private jet to France for this great festivity just to put it in perspective you know royal family Charles and Diana back in 1981 48 million dollars. I guess there was probably a lot more that you wouldn't have seen, but 110 dollars, 110 million dollars adjusted for inflation. Okay, and just to wrap up a, a, a bit about um, the, the end of the Raj and, and the history of that time, um, it, it's fascinating, as I said, to try and, and capture the history of India and its lengthy culture and events and disasters. At, and um, invasions, but but man, the country carries on, and the people still smile. And they most they are the most amazing people that I've come across. When you look at how many of them have had to get to where they are today, and you had this um, long period of of sort of British um, occupation, colonialism, started in about 1608 in the early days of the uh, I guess the the British East. Um, Indian company, which as a company really, really made a big foothold in, in India and started sort of ruling the place. And then the British um, crown moved in in 1847-48 and, and really got going properly with the, the colonialization of, of, um, of India and, and, some, and, and then sort of 100 years later, um, it all came to an end. Britain had just finished um, the Second World War. The country was broke. They suddenly couldn't sort of sustain all these colonies that they had. And they, they drove the, the partition of India and, the, and, and their withdrawal. And that had some really um, damaging consequences when they split off um, India um, into two states, Pakistan to the west and east, and, and India in the centre. In the in the centre, and, the, and there's some fascinating history about that. Anyway, that's that's my synopsis on India. As I say, for me, it's it's my favourite place. I've had um, some wonderful times there. Couldn't wish for nicer people, and and I don't think you've sort of experienced all these things: life, living colour, poverty, slums. Um, smiles, friendships, forgiveness. Um, if you haven't been to India, so if any of you, any of you, still have it on your bucket list, make an effort to get there. It's a fascinating place. It's also moved on. It's 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 modernised itself, and it's set, certainly a country you know to watch in the future. So thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, Kurt. Um, that's me. Thank you, John. That really was a fascinating presentation. What an amazing country, and there's so much to talk about. You did very well to encapsulate so much within such a short period. I'm sure there are many questions. The floor is now open for anybody who wishes to ask questions. Anybody? Just quickly on your four C's is carrot, cut, color, and clarity, of course. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm John, could I just say that was absolutely fascinating. And Marilyn, I'm sure henna party is much more meaningful than a hen party, so perhaps we should <laughs> start changing. <laughs> that was just such fun and absolutely fascinating, John. Thank you very much. The history is just incredible. And then the, the diamond and, and gemstones, so, so fascinating. I, I really uh, was enthralled. Thank you very much. Please, uh glad I could do that and and just so you know I mean we've also got an, a, a, an Indian lady our, our son-in-law is Indian and we have our mother-in-law his mother his mother you know in the audience with us as well oh welcome <laughs> welcome John I thought at one stage the diamond cutting industry was centered in Amsterdam and Israel 
when did it all move to India? Um, so, so yeah, it, it really started um, Israel in the back in back in the sort of sixties and seventies, and then it moved to Antwerp because it, it, Israel became expensive and there was no taxes in in Antwerp, but rightly so, as you say, Belgium. But again, you know, Belgium be, being European, and um, that there, there were sort of drives, particularly in in the in the late 80s, you know, the diamond business, as we know, it has always been very, or was always very opaque. Right? And, and that changed a huge amount when the Canadians, the, the, you know, the upstart Canadians came along and discovered a major diamond deposit in, in Northwest Canada in 1991. And suddenly, you know, the Canadian juniors, as we call them, were every time they found a diamond, they were putting it on, on stock exchange news releases. So suddenly, you know, companies like De Beers, who never really told you much about their diamond deposits, had to compete with Canadians, you know, who were throwing open everything. And, and, and that plus sort of the, the consequences of tax and tax being, tax has been introduced and cleanup of the Antwerp business, you know, drove, drove the, the business to India. And, and, and again, you know, these European countries and our country just can't compete with those labor costs and, and the, the quality of the workmanship. Um, you know, and, and as I say, it, it's had a negative effect because when you put all your eggs in one basket like that, you know, the Indian industry dominates and you have a, a black swan event like um, COVID, it really hurts because you, you, you don't have much other option as to where to go to buy, buy diamonds or, or whatever. Uh, anybody else? So it was a very, um, very enjoyable uh, presentation, I should say. It was excellent. And um, throughout the chat, I could actually hear your respect for the country and the people, which very often um, when people talk of India, there's that bit of, I don't know if I'm using the right word, condensation or condensation <laughs> or um, condescending tone or patronizing tone and that definitely didn't come off in your talk in fact there was that um sort of respect and that came through very clearly which was very nice to thank you to yeah, yeah i mean I, I just found them wonderful people from uh, you know when you first uh, my first trip was i think 97 when you pitch up at mumbai airport and you get in you walk out of that place and there's this this hive of people and back then, when you got out onto the street, you had to find a taxi and then you drive, you know, there's a fairly long route, as you will know, into Mumbai. And you see the, you know, the open sewers back then and the, you know, because of the caste system, you have um, a family living on the side of that sewer and a husband and wife and two small kids and they would be cleaning that sewer sort of every day. Um, and, 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 you know, you, you just see how people live and they, they've accepted their life and, and they, they, they get going and the work ethic and the pride, it's just amazing. You know, we, we could all learn in this country from trips to India. I, I think it's an amazing place. I almost Thanks. wonder, because I'm still begging my husband to take me there. And where do you live? Um, I'm from East London. Okay, good. Can I ask another question, John? In the fascinating presentation we had on Pakistan, Ewan was mentioning that there are so many highly trained geologists who hadn't worked, had the opportunity to work at all. Did you find something similar in India? Yeah, we did find that as well, Kurt. I mean, India, by comparison, has quite a, you know, an active um, mining industry. They mine a lot of coal, a lot of their electricity is coal generated, and they had quite big iron ore deposits. But we, we, you know, whenever we went into an area like um, the eastern part of, of Madhya Pradesh, which became Chattisgarh, you, we, we made an effort to engage with local institutions and the local university. And we were, we were also, uh, you know, inundated, not, not badly so, with applications and people wanting to, to you know, come and work and, and gain experience. Um, but um, certainly in India, there, there's a bigger mining industry, so, so there's you know, more job opportunities. But we, we again came across some great people and 
and and the key thing they you know they are so willing to work and so keen to learn new things it was it was always a pleasure to work with them and train them um, you know on, on that for example india has a very big they call it the Na N nmdc national minerals development corporation it's sort of a, a parastatal that works so they they are a big coal miner iron ore miner they 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 ran that little um, Panar Diamond Mine, not very successfully, was big organizations like that. You know, can't run small business, but it's, you know, there are, there, there's a strong mining culture in India. Uh, John, just on, on uh, back to geology, uh, are earthquakes a big problem, I suppose, with all that tectonic plate movement? Fascinating, Peter, that, you know, it tends to be around the edge. India likes, like, Africa or Southern Africa, obviously it's not as big as Africa, but the internal sort of part of India is quite stable. You know, it has this very old geological solid um, framework, but, but yeah, when you get into the Himalayas, you know, there's, there's regular activity there and, and down the sides, you know, in, the, in, the, um, in that sort of boundary area through to um, um, Bangladesh and, and on the other side, you know, on, on the Asian side of, of India, there's, there's regular lots of activity. And, and once in a while, you know, in the Himalayas, um, they have pretty serious earthquakes and, you know, people get killed and infrastructure gets, gets damaged. So, but, but, but the continent itself is a, a, it's fascinating. It's a good point you raise. And, and some of you will remember, um, Gert certainly will, that, um, we had a, a geologist, what was it, two years ago, heard uh, Lou Ashwell talk about um, the geology of, of sort of the Indian Ocean. And, and he pointed out little remnants of, of crustal, you know, old rocks stuck in the Indian Ocean. And, and those are probably remnants. So, so as India is skating north at this incredible rate, we, we think that parts of that underlying craton, you know, those, those keels are referred to the iceberg. So nine tenth of the iceberg is below water. So during this massive and very quick skate into Asia, you know, those bits of, of, of crustal rocks that Lou Ashwell talked about left in the Indian Ocean are probably remnants of India, you know, left behind, so to speak. Um, you know, so, so parts of the Indian continent were, were sort of delaminated in, in that process of moving into Asia very quickly. I visited uh, India in 2001 and uh, found them very interesting. John, thank you very much. That was most interesting. <clears throat> I visited the Navy. They have a very highly technically organized Navy mm. and impressive in the way they run their organization and the ships. Uh, I also lived in the Taj Mahal Hotel and I visited the Taj Mahal in Delhi. So one has that pictures in my mind. And I was fortunate enough to take my wife with me to Mumbai. Well, things I remember about Mumbai is how clever they were with space saving by removing the wing mirrors of taxis. We <laughs> can fit more taxis next to one another in the same lane. Absolutely. And how well they use their hooters to warn the people next to them that they're coming past them. Yeah. Most well orchestrated. <laughs> and the last thing is, Mumbai was a most impressive city to see how many dogs live in the streets. And the fact that the dogs don't make eye contact with you. They're not people dogs, they're dog dogs. Mm. John, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thanks. No, you, no your, your comment about the taxis, I mean, you, you know, it, it, what's the definition of organized chaos? Well, you know, you, know, you, you get caught up in a circle in India and, and, you know, you and I would end up spending our day on the, in the middle of the circle, petrified to move. But, you know, in, in Mumbai, everything, everything works. I'm not always sure how, how, but amazingly so. Any other questions? John, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about the Taj Mahal. It really is one of the most beautiful buildings in the world, as you've said. It was not only beautiful. Taking my wife there was a romantic experience. And of course, seeing the building is only half the story. 
because, as you know, there is another building that was planned on the opposite side of the river that was to duplicate the, the existing building, but in black stone. So the symmetry that was part of the architecture did not only apply to the building itself, but also to the layout of the whole area. And Shah Jahan had a palace with a window with, where he could sit and look at the, at the building. Maybe you want to tell us a little bit more about that. Yep, incredible, and 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 you know exactly, Kurt. I mean, and and the precision, you know, when you, when, when I mean, I didn't have a laser measure with me, but but I would think you know everything was built to sort of you know a, a tenth of a millimeter. It's just just the quality of the work, and when you look at that, um, you know, the inlays and the filigree of that those semi precious stones, uh, you know, and it's all done. Obviously, there's a pattern somewhere, but but when you watch the guys doing it, it's all done by by eye and hand, and I guess they've done it hundreds and thousands of times. But it is just so meticulous and so perfect, and 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 there again, it goes back to, you know, the pride and the workmanship. There's nothing done willy nilly. John, another thing that impressed me in India was the entrepreneurship you find everywhere. Many people think India is only a collection of poor people. In fact, there are almost more dollar millionaires in that country than there are people in South Africa. But everywhere you travel, north and south, east and west, so many of the activities are carried out by private sector individuals, whether it be little clinics, whether it be organizations teaching computer skills or any other schools. And I think in the long term, India may overtake China because it is a democracy and because entrepreneurship flourishes there. That is obviously just my personal view. You know, I'd say 100% and, it, and it's a tragedy, you know, our local government don't all go there and spend a year there, uh, you know, because because that's the future of South Africa. We, we in a sense, I believe, have that element in our, in our, you know, major part of the population. You just got to liberate it. And, 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 and absolutely, I mean, you know, you look at the diamond business and, and, and there, the diamond business is run through something like 2,500 family businesses, um, you know, but it all comes together in, in, in a grand plan. And, you know, everyone, everyone is competing, but also, you know, helping the other person. I mean, it's just a, just a fascinating society. Um, and and yeah, I mean, it, as I say, my only, you know, my main conclusion is if you haven't been there, just go and take a look. It's a bit of a shock to the system, but you know, being South Africans, you'll find it fascinating and you'll love it. Wish I could. Wish I could. You're never too old, Letitia. Just too poor. <laughs> Okay. Well, the great thing about India too, you know, get out in the country. Uh, some some of the best meals we had, and you can ask Marilyn, were certainly from my perspective. You know, out in mm. you go through a village, and you'd stop, and you'd go into a back street, and you'd eat, um, you know, rice and and curry and vegetables off a palm leaf, and it, yeah, and it was spotlessly clean and perfect. A great regret of my life that I, I never got there. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Uh, you know, it really was very interesting. Thank you. Because we had both the, the um, geology and the history and the culture. Very interesting. Amazing. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thanks so much. One last comment. Maybe Marilyn would also comment on that. The thing that fascinates me is how beautifully the women are dressed. Those saris are so colorful. And I'm not talking about only the rich people. I'm talking about people working on building sites, work yeah. in these beautiful saris, working on a construction site or working on, on the roads. I mean, it's apart from what you see in the hotels and everywhere. Everybody is so beautifully dressed and it's so colorful. I found it fascinating. Yeah, you know, as proud people, it doesn't matter if you're working in a rice paddy field, you know, they're proud. Yeah. Um, Marilyn, you must comment yeah, on well, that. It, yeah, I, I, um, I, I have to admit that I just was pretty glad after I'd been dressed in my sorry that I didn't have to do that every day. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was fascinating and it, it, I mean, the, I had to be dressed in it because I would never have known where to start. But it was, it, I mean, it was a beautiful sorry and I really felt very special in it. But yeah. all my outfits I had were 
really great. And you're right, uh, Geert, the, the, the women dress beautifully whatever they're doing. Well, you looked smashing too. You looked absolutely <laughs> smashing. Thank you. <laughs> John, thank you very much. It really was fascinating. And uh, you're wonderful the way you put your shows together and give us a whole spectrum of things, everything from the history, as Leticia said, of the geology and all the rest of it. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you to everybody, including some of the guests that logged in this morning. I hope you all enjoyed it as well. I'm going to close the meeting now. Goodbye to everybody.